We'll be in Judges chapter number four tonight. Judges chapter number four. I really enjoyed um, the series we just begun on person, the personalities of the saints. God has gifted each of us with a different personality that it's our job to be conformed to his image and to tra- turn into what he would have us to be. But that doesn't mean he didn't create us differently for a reason. So, so far, we've already looked at Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. This is Judges chapter number four. I'll give you a second there. It's near the beginning of your Bible, right after the, the first five books. Anyways, we already looked at Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, a very natural re- reaction to someone who's seen a great deal of pain in his life. We saw Ezekiel, the hardened prophet, one who it seemed like nothing really bothered him, so much so that God said, I don't want you to act like anything bothered you, bothers you. I want you to make sure that it's as if you have a hardened heart because you want to show exactly how bad my punishment is on Israel and the necessity of them turning back to him. Well, today we're going to look at two individuals. I thought about trying to only do one or the other, and then I figured, oh, they're in the same story. We're just going to stick with both of them. We're going to look at the cautious and the courageous today. How, do you, how would you define your risk analysis now at this stage of life? Has it changed any from, let's say, 10 years ago, 20, 50? Have you, do you analyze things a little bit differently? Probably. I, I hope so, at least. It only makes sense if you do. I remember several years ago, I always, I always find it amusing when sometimes I would talk to some very um, distinguished older men, and they would never take a risk now. Well, at least not when their wives are around. But they always, they always like to talk about what they did as teenagers. They always like talking about their first car. Now, maybe your far, first car was more like mine. It was one that you just used for transportation. Or maybe it was your h- highest form of entertainment. And I remember talking to some of these men, and some of you, and you talk about your first car. And you talk about all the things you had done to it to increase the speed. Make it faster and faster and fa- And sometimes I begin to wonder, like, that much horsepower in a modern car would be scary. I can't imagine that much horsepower without airbags and without modern tires. It just blows my mind. It's like, good gracious, how did you make it out of your teenage years? I heard one talking to one gentleman, really, really nice man, many years ago. He says, yes, I remember. We used to, we used to drag race down Main Street every Friday night. Like, literally drag race. And the police couldn't catch us. And to them, that was the greatest form of fun. But they would never do that now. Why? Their risk analysis changed, and for the better. We understand some people are natural risk takers all through life, and some are not. I'm not. I don't know if you ever gathered that. I'm not a risk taker. I mean, even as a child, my brothers used to laugh at me because I was always the cautious one. The one who always thought about consequences before I did anything. And then a few years went by. My little brother has always been a risk taker. He's always been the one that would do anything. Perhaps you remember Mary Poppins. He tried to recreate Mary Poppins off the roof of our house once. It didn't work out well for him, but he was very lucky, so he can still walk, thank goodness. But that's just the way he is. His risk analysis hasn't improved much. But my older brother is a whole different story. He's not much older than me, but I find it interesting that he used to be the one that used to make fun of me for not taking risk, and now the shoe's on the other foot. It's totally different. Like, my risk analysis doesn't doesn't seem to have changed, and all of a sudden, all the things I think are normal, he thinks are risky. Oh, don't do that, Nathan. Oh, no. And it's just the way we change. Some of us are risk takers. Some of us are a little bit more risk averse. We're not really willing to take that chance. We realize it can hurt us for either being overly safe or being overly risky. We understand there are pros and cons in each case. We're going to look at two individuals where one one individual is going to be extremely risk-averse, very nervous of doing anything unless he's absolutely sure. He is the one who's looking for the the sure thing if he were a betting man. And the other one seems to not give a second thought to her safety. We're going to be starting off in Judges 4, verse number 1. The Bible says, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. 
And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had nine hundred chariots of iron, and twenty years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness, Lord. We thank you for the fact that you use each of us. Help us to remember whether we are naturally courageous or naturally cautious to remember that ultimately you are our source, that we, you, are our, you are our source for everything that we need in our lives. You're the one that we should trust. Lord, we ask you to please help us to, have our, to keep our faith residing in you and trusting in you for every step of our path. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Here in this account, we see, of course, the children of Israel have messed up yet again. This is after the death of Ehud. Maybe we'll reference him late in the future, but he is the one who stabbed the mighty, the mighty large king, the one who was either left-handed or perhaps partially disabled and only could use, the, use his left hand. Fascinating account, but not today's message. Anyways, this is, of course, after he has died, and it seems like all of a sudden the children of Israel have messed up again. Ehud had given them victory, then he had ruled them. And now they've gone off to do their own thing. God, of course, will bring his children back to him. The Bible says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. That is a New Testament principle, but we see it very clearly with the children of Israel as well. Here in this passage, he sends, of course, this gentleman, Sisera, the captain of the hosts, who has 900 chariots of iron. This is incredibly significant because we're not talking about just chariots, but they're iron chariots. With every, every, every technological advancement in any military power, things change massively. This is an, at a period of time when iron was still a younger, a younger tool. It was still a little bit more difficult to access it. In fact, we'll find in a couple hundred years, King David and Saul will find, or King, excuse me, King Saul and his son Jonathan will be the only two men in the entire kingdom who can find good, solid swords because the entire metal trade has been monopolized by the Philistines. One of the earliest examples, at least in the Bible, of gun control, if you will. And that's exactly what they were doing. Well, here in this case, this man Sisera doesn't just have better swords. He has 900 of the best types of equipment you can, you can imagine. And beyond that, they're also iron. They're the strongest ones available at that time. State-of-the-art weaponry, as it were. Perhaps you remember a few months ago where one of our politicians mentioned that um, the American people have no reason to keep their firearms, their Second Amendment rights, because the government ha now has nukes and F-16s. As it's kind of one of those, someone wasn't watching his speech, as would be my guess. He really should have rethought that one, because he kind of just threatened the American people. But whenever you stop to think of it, that's kind of a difficult scenario. What are you going to do against an atomic bomb? Probably not much. That's kind of the imagery we're given here. 900 chariots of iron. Very little this, the people of Israel can do against this type of force. But the Bible says in verse number four, we'll first of all see the courageous individual. This is going on for quite, quite, a, quite a long period of time. 20 years they've been oppressed by this man Sisera. Remember in verse number four, the Bible says, And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lab Labadoth, she judged Israel at that time. So here we find the, the woman Deborah, one of the, one of the few individuals of great power that we find this early in the Bible that's a woman. Very interesting woman. So we find her position, she's considered the prophetess, one who tells God's word, one who is able to speak with God. We also find that she is the one doing the judging. Now, if you recall in the book of the Judges, most of these people are not necessarily um, appointed to a position. It is not necessarily a judicial position, it's just one they kind of gravitate into. And then because of their power, because of their capabilities, all of a sudden the people begin to entrust them to negotiate their problems. That seems to be this woman, Deborah. The Bible says in verse number five, and she dwelt under the palm tree of, De of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel and Mount Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. So the idea of judging here is the idea of being able to discern between two sides. So if you had a problem, you'd take it to her. She had evidently enough wisdom that regardless of her position, people knew you could trust her. Have you ever met someone who had a position but didn't have enough wisdom to do their job? Did you go to them whenever you had something you needed to get fixed? Of course not. You went to someone you trusted, someone that you knew had a track record of knowing what to do. Someone who had good wisdom. 
Evidently, Deborah has come to her, her, her place because of her abilities, not because of what society has put, what kind of position she's been given within the society. And as a result, people trust her. I find it interesting. Um, I, I, there are all those strange sorts of uh, reality TV shows where you go and talk to people about your problems. I never understood any of that nonsense. But in, in a manner of speaking, that's kind of what Deborah has, except she just does it under a palm tree. Her wisdom is good enough that she doesn't need a TV stage to do it. She knows what's going on, and she'll tell you. She will help you. A palm tree is just fine if the product's good. Have you ever noticed that about restaurants? All of a sudden, you don't care as much about where the restaurant is if the food's good. Oh, but if the food isn't good, everything else had better be just fine. Well, that's kind of the idea here. She has a lot of good wisdom, and she's offering it. And she dwelled under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel and Mount Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for a judgment. So she has a good position. It's a position that's based upon her ability. The Bible says even a child is known by his doings. Well, here, in this case, this woman is very influential because of what she knows and the wisdom she has. She has the ear of God. She knows what God is saying. And as a result, the people of Israel trust her. So anyways, she is, she is here. She's judging. People are coming to her. I'm kind of curious, and we'll see here in a, at the end of the message, that we aren't exactly sure how old this lady De Deborah is. It is, in my opinion, that she is a much older lady, and we'll see why here at the end of the message, but we don't know. My imagination runs wild here. I wonder, was she a young lady? Was she an older one? Was she a grandmother? I kind of lean towards the latter. But remember, she had her position because of her wisdom and relationship with God, not because of her military prowess. She was not a soldier. God did not tell her to go conquer the enemy. God says, I just want you to help out and tell someone else to go do it. Well, let's go ahead and see now what her pronouncement is. The Bible says in verse number 6, And she sent and called Barak, the son of Ab Abinoam, out of Kedesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. So here we see, of course, the courageous individual. We'll see why she's courageous in a moment. But her job is simply to talk to God's man to go tell him to do his job. Tell him, all right, this is what God says. Now, why, aren't you going to go do, why are you going to go do it now, or are you going to reject God's will? This is her position. But let's go on and see exactly who she's talking to and a little bit more about, about them. Of course, recall that she is here outside of Bethel. This is right about the dead center of Israel, just north of Jerusalem but south of the northern tribes. The center of Israel. Everyone is coming through this area. So let's look at the cautious man now. The Bible says in verse number 6, And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kedesh Naphtali, now, we don't know who this man Barak is. We don't know his age. He doesn't exactly sound like a courageous soldier. And we'll see in a moment that he will even group himself within those who are in the home guard, those who remain, those who are left behind. The word remnant comes to mind. Have you ever noticed in a time of war, especially in an all-out war, who gets sent to the front lines first? Usually your younger men. Usually. And then all of a sudden you have a little bit older men and then a little bit younger men. And then near the end of the war, if it's been a very severe one, you'll have just about everyone fighting. You'll, have even, you'll, you'll find that even women will be on the front line troops. You'll find that many times you'll find teenage boys on the, in the front lines. In World War II, it was even a custom that the Germans would even draft some of their elderly citizens. They realized they may not be capable in the front lines, so they actually began to send them, sadly, to actually... And the actual um, logistical part of the Holocaust. Though so some of their oldest citizens were actually were the ones doing that. Those who should have known better. But those, that's just the job they were given. Here we'll see that in this case, this man will group himself with the remnant. Those who are left behind. Maybe because he's older. Maybe he's just a bad soldier. Maybe he just doesn't want anymore. 
but he is sent, and God calls him. But look at what Deborah says to him. It says, first of all, she sends and she calls him, and she says, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying? She asks him and says, Didn't God already tell you? Hath not is an interesting phrase. It could be that, she, that Barak has not heard of this message before. But it sounds like, by the idea that it's giving a past tense negative word here, interrogative, it says, didn't you already hear about this? Why haven't you gone yet? Hath not, God's, hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, go and draw toward Mount Tabor? But we aren't exactly sure why he has not gone yet. We are assuming that more than likely he had at least God had either told him specifically or God had been preparing his heart. So we can't fault him too much. We don't find that there's any condemnation here. Deborah is not fussing at him. She's reminding him. It's God told you to go, didn't he? Then you need to go. Nowhere here in this passage do we find either Deborah or Barak condemned for anything they do. So I'm gonna, I want to be very cautious about that. We aren't exactly sure exactly what had gone on before. We aren't exactly sure why, here in this passage, Barak is so cautious about what's going to happen. But he is very cautious. He is very worried from what we can tell. But as we go on, we see not only is he told that he, he should have known a little bit about this before, but he's also given a very clear plan. It says, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali, and of the children of Zebulun, and I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Sisera. Have you ever met someone before? I remember years ago, I knew, I knew a lady that um, her excuse whenever she was working a job, she never let anyone train her to do anything else other than her job. She says, you know what, I don't want to know how to do that. And that way her excuse would be whenever she was asked to, I don't know how to do that. I need to find somebody else to do it. And she just didn't want to do any more than what she already had to do. Now, I can't say that's always a good idea. Most of us appreciate someone who actually knows a great deal about a great deal of different things, so they can be very useful. But here in this passage, Barak can't use that excuse. Most of us are afraid when we're asked to do something new, something we don't understand, something we haven't tried before. That's normal. But God says, you know what, Barak, you don't have that excuse. I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. I love the fact that God does make it very clear all throughout his word that he will give us the strength that we need every moment that we need. He'll also tell us how to do what we need to do. God will never leave his children confused as to what his will is or how he wishes them to do it. Maybe he doesn't give you and I God's will like he does Barak here. Barak's directions are very clear. Look what God says. It says, not only does he tell him go and what he should do, he tells him who to recruit and how many to recruit. He says, you need to recruit 10,000 men from these tribes and go here. He says, you don't even have to worry about a strategy. I got it all covered for you. Everything's covered for you. But the Bible continues. He's given a clear plan, but now he's also given an, an assurance of a victory. The Bible says in verse number 7, And I will deliver him into thine hand. God says, I'm going to make it very clear. I will do it for you. I will deliver you. The promise is absolutely sure. You probably heard someone say that they were betting on a sure thing before. Not that we agree with gambling, of course. But what, what do we mean by that? It's something that it's like you cannot lose. You're absolutely sure this will happen. So therefore, you can risk something on it because there's no risk. Here, Barak is assured there is no risk. You will win. The Bible continues. It says here in this passage, look, look what, look what his, his response is. He's given his mission very clearly, but he has a request. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. Now I find this one interesting. He's not complaining about the mission he has, but he just doesn't want to go by himself. Now I'm curious why. Why in the world, Barak, would you want this, this lady to go with you? She's not a soldier. She's not going to protect you. She's not going to give you a better strategy than what God has already given you. Is she going to help you in any way? Perhaps he's thinking, 
I want to make sure she's telling me the truth. Now, that's my cynical mind. Like maybe if, she, if she's in, at risk with me, she is a little bit more invested and she's not pulling my leg about what God said. But then again, that's just me being cynical. The reality is perhaps he just wanted to hear God's message in the midst of the battle. It's a very interesting thought. I don't know what other excuse he could have. It's not like she could be his bodyguard. I believe here in this case, he's simply trying to be very cautious about doing God's will the right way. Maybe too cautious, but he is being cautious. The Bible continues, And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding. The journey that thou, ta- that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with, Balak, uh, with Barak to Kadesh. Now look at her response here. So now we have a very courageous woman that apparently has no military training. This is not Joan of Arc here. She's not an Amazonian woman who has all great power and a great ability to be able to conquer. It's not like she's an inhabitant of Sparta that actually trained their women in in warfare. She is just someone, a guidance counselor, basically. That's basically what she does for a living. And she's willing to go with him. So as we look at this, let's have a a couple of notes that we ought to add here. Nowhere here do we find that God condemns either of their actions. God does not condemn Barak. And we also find that Barak does not complain when he says the the honor of the victory will not be to him. Now, I actually find this commendable. Do you remember what King Saul would say? Anytime anyone might possibly get the, the honor over him, he would start killing people. Do you remember what any other character throughout the Bible would complain? Do you remember what the disciples complained? When they talked about who would be on Jesus' right and left hands. They are willing to throw each other under the bus for that and get angry with each other. Barak doesn't seem to have any concern of that. It is my belief he's probably simply concerned with having God, the Word of God, near him. But we aren't sure. Regardless, he's being exceptionally cautious. He wants to know exactly what God is going to say when and the fact that he's doing the right thing. God does not condemn him for that. We know that there is a potential danger in... um, and being overly cautious. You've probably heard a lot, seen a lot of these, um, these warning stickers on dangerous devices that don't make any sense. Did you know that most chainsaws come with the following uh, warning on the, on, on the blade? It says, do not hold wrong end of chainsaw. Well, no duh. I mean, <laughs> I, if, if you almost, I won't say you deserve it, but hmm, if, if you can't figure that out, you most certainly don't need to be using a chainsaw. How about this one? On, on, on a jet ski, it says, never use open flame or match to check fuel level. Okay? A hair dryer, do not use while sleeping. Blowtorch bottle, contents may catch fire. Or a car sunshade, one of those that cover your whole windshield. It says, do not drive with sunshade in place. Well, this one really confuses me. You know, a little letter opener. It says, safety goggles recommended. I think sometimes our safety sallies have gone a little bit too far. Or perhaps you've, now I know I I like dogs, and some of you do too, but not everyone has to. But it used to annoy me a little bit as a teacher, especially of young children, when I would have someone who had never, one of my students who had never been around dogs and had always been taught to be fearful dogs. I really wanted to tell their parents, you know, that's probably a bad idea. You don't have to have a dog, but make sure you tell your kid how to behave around them. Because, of course, fear, what does that do to a dog? It usually encourages the dog to bite. Tragedy, but that's the way it works. And it's one of those ideas that someone's being overly cautious, and then the end result, it brings a negative as a result of that, that, that fear. Too much caution can also be a problem. But we also know too much confidence can be a problem. Bertrand Russell said when he was writing an essay on the rise of Nazi Germany, he said, The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. The reality is we should all be willing to doubt our own motives and what we are doing, even when it comes to doing what the Lord would have us. But we should remember to take those doubts to God and compare what we're doing with what God says. We've all met people who are so confident in what they were doing, and the reality is they were Oh, frankly, very wrong. 
We all like it when we have, meet someone who's extremely sincere, but sincere doesn't mean right. So this is one case where I think we probably ought to, we ought to give some credit to Barak here. Yes, maybe he should not be quite as, um, quite as cautious as he is, but perhaps he should instead also be very, make sure he, has his, his, he takes his caution to the Lord to make sure that what he is doing is what God says. We can commend that. We can also can come in, more importantly, when he takes his caution and he throws it to the wind. When he's absolutely sure what God wants him to do, we find in verse number 10, And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. So we see all of a sudden when he's absolutely sure he's doing what's right, he goes and gets the 10,000 men, and Deborah goes with him. Verse number 14, And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor, and 10,000 men after him. Look at how, how that, phrase, that is phrased. It says, Barak gets up, and the 10,000 men follow. That's unusual for almost any commander. Even back then, that was a little strange. Joab wouldn't, even, wouldn't have even done this. All of a sudden, it seems Barak has found his courage because maybe he was with a courageous woman or perhaps because he was finally convinced and threw his caution at the feet of Christ or at the feet of his Messiah and understood that God's word would indeed be true for him. So the classic statement of the British Special Air Service, who dares wins, and that's exactly what happens here. The Bible says in verse number 16, but Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host, unto Harasheth of the Gentiles. And all the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. Here we see in this case that he does exactly what he should do. Better to have tried and failed than to have never tried at all. Well, he tried and succeeded because he was trying and doing it the right way. See, there's nothing, wrong, there's nothing necessarily wrong with caution as long as it doesn't divorce us from our faith. There is also nothing wrong with courageous faith as long as it is found in God alone. Here we find these two individuals, and we'll see in a moment exactly some hints about who they might have been. But these two individuals who apparently don't seem to be worried about who gets the honor, I think we should also commend that as well. Barak doesn't seem to mind so much about who gets the victory. In fact, another woman who might actually be a Gentile woman will get, the, will get all the praise. Barak doesn't complain. In fact, we'll see in chapter number 5, instead, he'll turn his complaint actually into a praise because he's more concerned with God's will being done than who gets the glory. We also see Deborah here, who most certainly had no desire to be in this position, but yet because of her courage, God's victory was able to be accomplished. Let's go over, and of course, this is a Thanksgiving message as we, as we end it. The reality is, these two individuals, neither of which were out for their own glory, both give us one of the most beautiful songs in the entire Bible. We frequently cite David, and rightfully so, for all of, the, all of his great musical works, but these two come together and sing a duet for us in chapter number 5. The Bible says in verse number 1 of chapter number 5, Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinamam, on that day, saying, Praise ye the Lord for the avenging, for the avenging of Israel. When the people willingly offered themselves, Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes. I, even I, will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praises to the Lord God of Israel. These two will go on for an entire chapter, praising God for his acts and relating exactly what has happened. But nowhere will you see either one taking bows for their actions. Instead, every praise they have is to God. We, of course, have one who is very courageous, one who took God at, at, at God's word at face value and believed it the first time. One who had to have a little help along the way, but he still believed it and was desirous for God's victory. As we read through these verses, we'll see that each of these is a, is a beautiful phrase. All the way down to verse number five, it talks about God's power, the mountains melting before the Lord. Then we also see in verse number six and seven, we find a little bit about Deborah herself. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied, and the travelers walked through byways. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel 
until that I, Deborah, rose, that I arose a mother in Israel. This is an affectionate term, typically ascribed to someone who's older, or at least someone who's had children, or in this case, one who has a maternal instinct for an entire nation. In other words, probably a maternalistic figure, probably of an, old, an older maternalistic figure, a mother of Israel. Going on, we also see a little bit more. We see in verses 12 and 13, the man she chose, or God chose, excuse me. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, utter a song, arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles. The idea of those that remain be home, at home because they're not part of frontline troops. Does he made the one that remained, Balak, or Barak, I made him to have victory over the king's best armies. I made him to have dominion over the mighty. See, God is making it very clear, and as is are these two individuals, that it's not their courage, their caution, their cunning that gave them the victory, but God alone. They're giving all the glory to God for what they have done. We also will go on and we'll see that this passage gives us a hint about exactly how severe it is. Verses 15 through the end, it talks about, of course, the bemoaning of Sisera back in his home camp. And talking about his mother, saying, where is he? And worrying about him. But then we'll see that what they try to tell her is the fact in verse number 29, her wise ladies answered her, yea, she returned answer to herself. Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey to every, every man a damsel or two to Sisera, prey of diverse colors? Essentially, they're saying, He's not come home yet because he's still spoiling the nation. He's still molesting the citizens and stealing their stuff, except in a rather less delicate fashion. That's basically what's being said here. But Deborah and Barak, the two individuals I probably would not have picked. At the very least, Barak is not a courageous enough man for me to put him on my short list of those I want to go defend me. I'd want someone who wasn't so reticent about violence. There's a time when you want a peaceful person, and there's also a time when you want a violent one. This is one where you and I would probably have picked a violent, but not God. See, God enjoys getting, using babes and sucklings, as we'll see in other portions of Scripture, to get his praise. He enjoys using weak vessels, like Paul, when Paul was having physical problems. He enjoys using foolish vessels, like, well, Peter, to be honest. He enjoys using scared vessels, or at least cautious vessels, like Barak or maybe courageous vessels that don't exactly have the physicality to back it up, like Deborah. In other words, God likes using you and I. He likes using individuals that will simply do his will. So no matter whether you're impulsive or courageous or cautious, God says, I still have a purpose for you. But remember, especially as we come to this time of Thanksgiving, all of us should be writing our own song, as it were. We should all be able to go back in our lives and look back and see what God has done for us and how God has used us and see that it was strictly his power that allowed us to do so. I believe that's one of the great lessons of this passage is the fact that it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. Nowhere in this passage was that Deborah's job or was it good grief. Barak was a soldier. It most certainly wasn't his job. But evidently, in God's eyes, all of us have a duty to praise Him. Praise Him through the songs we sing, or the best we can. Praise Him in the words we say, and absolutely the gratitude in our own hearts. As we get ready to close here in a word of prayer, one of the things I praise the Lord for is the fact that He will use each of us, no matter our personalities. No matter, granted here, we understand that Barak needed to be a little bit less cautious, and maybe Deborah a little more so. And I think that's one of the reasons God uses a body of believers. But let us remember that God will use us and we can praise him for even the privilege of being used in each and every, every service that he has for us. So as we close, of course, we'll remember our prayer request. Also, we have a lot to praise the Lord for today. I think even looking around, I'm incredibly grateful for the church that God has put me at. And I assume you are as well. We can praise the Lord for the body of believers we have, for where he's placed us, and his goodness to us individually. So let's remember that as well as we go to Lord in prayer.